like pasta. You know, when the patient comes to you and they ask you a question, well, what is anti-PD-1 therapy and how does this work? How do you explain this to the patient? So it's a very interesting concept now that we have immune therapies to explain this is different from traditional chemotherapy that we may be considering for other patients with other diseases that we're treating. And so I like to just tell patients that the immune system is like a police force within their body, policing against viruses and bacteria and things trying to invade them, but also polices against cancer. And for whatever reason, in that individual patient, their body is just not fighting the melanoma strong enough. And so PD-1 is a way of enhancing the patient's immune system to try to help their own body's immune system destroy the tumor. That usually just kind of general fundamental framework is, is really helpful for patients. And then also explaining that they're not going to need to walk around with a mask, that they're not going to be immunosuppressed, that the side effects that they may experience from this are related to our enhancing their immune system strength not so much that we're giving them chemotherapy that will make them more susceptible to infections and or have hair loss because a lot of patients come in and they worry about looking like a cancer patient or needing to walk around with a mask or losing their hair. And I think education about this being an entirely different approach than chemotherapy, not necessarily without any toxicities, and it is important that we understand that, but first just explaining the rationale for this in a broad picture, I think that's important. And most patients do take well to the concept. And speaking actually of the toxicities, uh, Georgina, how do you explain the toxicities to the patients and what are the most common toxicities and how do you manage these in, in Australia? So, I mean, and that's a really important point, particularly when you're talking about combination immune therapy. So I use a very similar framework to Mike. I talk about the mode of action that we're stimulating their immune system and in doing so, we're hoping to kill the cancer cells, melanoma cancer cells, but we may start attacking some of their normal tissue. Their immune system may start attacking some of their normal tissue. I highlight the fact that it can actually attack any tissue and we have no way of predicting which one, but there are common. Uh, and I usually really use gestures mm -hmm. so that they get a visual as well. You know, there are five common, for example, uh, skin, uh, diarrhea, because their, their bowel can be attacked by the immune system. Um, endocrinopathies, particularly thyroid when we're talking about anti-PD-1, um, but also hyperphysitis, very rare with anti-PD-1 alone, much more common with the combination of CTLA-4 and PD-1, hepatitis, and then when I talk about anti-PD-1, I do mention some of the rarer things as well, definitely with the combination, but I do say, and sometimes your lungs can be affected, you can get inflammation in the lung, and we'll be asking you every time we see you about whether you're getting a cough or whether you're short of breath, just so that they can contextualize it. Mm -hmm. The most important thing though, is that there is a framework for the patient to contact the cancer center to let them know, or even to ask whether this is something they need to be worried about. Because the last thing I want is one of my patients sitting at home with diarrhea and not acting upon it for 24, 48, even three days, and then we've got a really big problem on our hands. So the other principle is you know about it early, you can treat it or monitor it early and patients do a lot better and get through their treatment with a much higher quality of life. So it's very important. Yeah, it's Mike. It's one of the points that I also reinforce with the patients because again, as, as Georgina said, our real concern is, is if patients develop these side effects and don't notify a physician, the side effects can become very severe and even quite dangerous. Uh, and we know that again, patients are often maybe reluctant to tell physicians about side effects because of the fear that their treatment will be stopped. And one of the interesting things we've observed over time is that patients who do develop these side effects seem to actually have a higher chance of actually benefiting from the treatment. And indeed, if we see those types of toxicities, stopping their treatment and using immunosuppressive medications mm -hmm. to get them under control does not obviate the ability of the treatment to work. That it, this appears to be separable, the toxicities that come from the regimen versus the anti-tumor activity. And so again, really reinforcing with the patients how important it is for them to let us know if these side effects start. Now, another question that we often get about patients also when they start on these therapies is that, you know, how soon do you expect to see a response to these therapies? So what is, uh, how do you advise patients on that? Let's say if they're on monotherapy, anti-PD-1 therapy versus being on the combination of nivolumab plus ipilimumab. So I think, I know there's a notion that immune therapy responses take a long time, but the reality is we see shrinkage of tumor sometimes very quickly. And even with PD-1 monotherapy, certainly with the combination, a lot of the data in the clinical trials will report something like median time to response. And often that's median time to resist to find partial response. But these patients are having tumors that are shrinking the entire time yeah. from the beginning of therapy. So I 
don't know if patients, I don't think it matters so much to them when the median time to the rhesus partial response is. And so sometimes if that's three months or six months or, or whatever, I think they want to know, are my tumors going to start shrinking right away? And I think in many of the responders, you do see that shrinkage right away. However, it is important to note some patients don't shrink right away. Some will remain stable for a while and then shrink slower over longer periods of time. Some people have shrinkage of existing disease with presence of new lesions, and that doesn't necessarily mean that the treatment isn't working in those patients and can be continued. And then there's the notion of these pseudoprogressive cases or immune-related responses where patients may have apparent worsening of their tumor before ultimate benefit and shrinkage. I think the important message there is that that is still unfortunately a rare phenomenon, that that isn't what we expect to necessarily happen in all patients. We do usually see that the majority of the patients that are having really clear progressive disease unfortunately do kind of progress. So we really have to take care of those patients very cautiously and, and although we can't rule out the possibility of a late benefit, we should start be thinking about what if this really isn't working, what are my other options at that point.